What's the most important thing you want the world to know about you? What? You like who you want? Huh? That's what you want them to know? Mm -hmm. How would you describe your sister? Okay, did you say crazy and weird, like I said before, but the best? Or, but nice? Kind? Uh-huh. Okay. So crazy and weird, but kind. Uh-huh. Okay. Tell me about Isaac's relationship with his sister. Ah, uh, man. They are the greatest. Um, Natalie loves him so much that up until she was probably three years old, I had to explain to her every month why she couldn't marry her brother when she got older. Um, they would play dress up and, and get married. He would, you know, she would just do that all the time. Uh, she loves him so much. What is it like to kind of translate for your brother? Um, well, for me, I've known him since he was born. So I've just kind of understood him my whole life. So again, it's normal to me. How do you describe the bond that you two have together? Like Isaac's my favorite person in the whole wide world and I think it's the same for him. Is it the same for you? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. She knows him so much better than I do and he's my boy. You know, they, they're like, they're like twins, but they're not, they're 19 months apart. Um, it's just amazing seeing them. I would describe her as the absolute perfect guardian angel for Isaac. And I think they equally have as much love for each other. How would you describe your brother? Like the best brother in the world. He's really sweet because we never get in fights. And if we do, it's because I want to stop playing video games and he doesn't. What's your favorite video game, Isaac? The Marvel one. Mm -hmm. He likes being Hulk Smash and A-Bomb. When you two play video games, how does it work? Are you able to play Isaac? Is it adapted somehow? It is adaptive, but Isaac prefers me playing sometimes so he can just watch me play. If you had to pick one word to describe your mom, what word would you pick? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, dude. <laughs> what is it like to be Isaac's mom? Oh, it's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, there's so many things you could say about this kid. Um, it is, it is a true blessing, really. I mean, he's been my little man since... Natalie has always been a daddy's girl. From the moment she was born, those two have had a super special bond. Um, and, and it was pretty... I felt the same way when Isaac was born. Of course, I love both my kids very much, but Isaac was always my little... He was just, he needed me a lot when he was little, so it was really... It was pretty special, so we're pretty close, huh? I'm glad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is Isaac's diagnosis and how does it impact him? Uh, his diagnosis is um, SMA type 1. And the easiest way for me to explain it is his body is completely broken, but his mind and his personality and his emotions are completely intact. When was he first diagnosed? <sighs> Two days before his four month birthday. What were the early symptoms that something was not normal? Um, some of the people kind of call it like floppy baby syndrome, where you just, you know, some babies are just kind of floppy. And that was the first sign, but our PCP thought that he would grow out of it. What is it like to have spinal muscular atrophy? To you, it's normal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is it like to have a brother with SMA? Sometimes I think about what it would be like if he didn't, and sometimes I wish that he didn't, but at the same time, he it kind of makes him who he is. What does it mean that he has SMA type one? Type one is the most severe. 
That means he has the least amount of batteries left in his system. He's the weakest. He's the most vulnerable. Can you describe his muscular movement and the extent of what he's able to move his muscles? Well, when he was a newborn, you know, he still weighed very little. So he had the muscular structure of a normal newborn, so he could still move his arms and legs like normal. But with SMA, the muscles you're born with are, that's as big as they're gonna get. They're not gonna get any bigger. So when you gain weight through gaining uh, bone mass or just fat mass or anything, it appears like you're getting weaker, but it's not that you're actually getting weaker, it's that your body's getting too heavy for your weak muscles to move. So in the beginning he could reach and he would grab onto things and then he slowly lost the ability to do that. And then if you don't use it, you lose it. And atrophy came in and his ankles atrophied and his hands atrophied. Before this interview, Isaac, we asked you if you wanted to use your eye gaze or if you wanted to use your voice and you said you'd rather speak. Is that your preferred way to communicate? Mm -hmm. yes. Isaac, will you introduce your dad? <laughs> you just want to do it with your voice? Or do you want to do it when you talk her? Your voice? Why do you like speaking with your voice? It's just easier. Uh -huh. And most of the time you're surrounded by people who can understand you. Uh -huh. Is it important to allow Isaac the ability to make the decision of how he wants to communicate? Yes. I, I mean... I believe communication really truly is a human right and that's something that if he wants to communicate with his eyes or with his voice or with his talker, at the same time, he also understands that it, especially at school, in the school setting, that sometimes it's the appropriate thing is to use his communication device to be typing or answering um, because not everybody understands his vocalizations right away. Even us sometimes, right? But I have to ask you, was that a yes or a no? Tell me more clearly because it's just kind of this non-committal <laughs> response. Um, and so his, you know, his teachers and therapists, we've all talked with him about it over the years of little by little, you know, you're going to need to rely on it a little bit more as you get into more sophisticated communication. You told me off camera that you're Isaac's CNA at school. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, I mean, a CNA is a certified nurse's aide. And so when Isaac was diagnosed about a year later, well, when he was diagnosed, I was still a stay-at-home dad, but I still did other jobs. Um, but I quit all my jobs and I went to school to become a certified nurse's aide so I could actually be his trained aide and still get paid a little bit of money <laughs> to be with him all the time. Do you like having your dad as a CNA? Mm -hmm. What is it like to be able to do that for Isaac? Uh, I, I like it because I get to spend all my time with my little man, but at the same time, it's, it's really hard. It's really tiring, but I think we get along pretty well, so it makes it kind of fun. Right, dude? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So when you're in school, Isaac, is your dad with you throughout the day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about that routine of what it's like for him in school and what you help out with. Well, at school, I'm only supposed to be there for medical support. So Isaac also has a para and um, they're the person that helps him with academics, helps him like if he needs to draw something, helps hold his hand or helps him write down stuff on paper or helps him paint in art class or hold the instrument in music class. And so basically I just, I'm supposed to be back in the shadows just monitoring his ventilator and his feeding and things like medical related things. What was it like when you first started as Isaac's CNA to see him in school? At first I was amazed at how well he was doing and how well teachers and peers talked to him and how easily he was accepted. Um, that really blew me away. But then I also realized how much he couldn't do, and that was hard because I just wanted to step in and help him at every moment, but I really couldn't because I was medical only. Isaac, what are some of the things that are difficult for you at school? Mm -hmm. 
Nothing? Mm -hmm. You think everything's easy? Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I ask that same question to your dad? Mm -hmm. What are some of his big obstacles in school? I wish he could run and play with his friends. I wish he could um, paint his ceramics by himself. Is this something that you think about too, Isaac? Mm -mm. No. What's it like to know that he doesn't think about that? It makes me feel better. It makes me know that it only bothers me. When you are out at recess and your friends might be playing some sport, what do you do? <laughs> play music <laughs> and play tethered all. Yeah. He always has at least one to three, sometimes five friends that will quit their game when they see him come out and play with him. And this school has music set up like xylophones and bells and stuff and they'll go play with that or they'll play tetherball with him, or they'll just play catch. They'll do anything that he could do with help, because that's one area where I get to help him, so playing catch, we'll play, and I'll help him catch and help him throw. He loves it. Everything seems happy, and it is happy, but it's still hard at the same time. And I wish in this fast-paced world, everyone would just stop and take a look and talk and be aware of their surroundings and just realize that some people really need something that other people are taking for granted. What is something people could do to help you as a caregiver? <sighs> the, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, I've always been the type of person that would take out a challenge by myself. And so I think the hardest thing is for me to ask for help and to ask for support when I think I should be able to do it myself. So instead of saying, can I help you? Pick something specific and say, I'm gonna help you with this and just do it. Does that lack of want to reach out on your part cause burnout sometimes? Yes. What does that feel like? It's horrible. I, it's, it's almost like a depressive, I don't wanna do anything. I feel overwhelmed, I'm frustrated, I'm angry. I'm just tired, really tired. How do you manage still being a caregiver when experience, experiencing burnout? I don't. That's when my wife and my daughter step in and they help. They're the best. Are you effective at communicating when you do need that little bit of rest? Not really. It's my wife and my daughter that realize it and they say, you need to, you need to take a breather or you need to step away for a minute. What is it like to have that family unit who understands that and supports you in those moments? Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without them. Your husband mentioned that sometimes he feels burnt out, but he doesn't communicate it. What are the indicators to you that he needs a break? Um, he's a really hard time getting out of bed. Um, has a hard time sleeping. Uh, like different times. Has a hard time going to sleep at night. Has a hard time waking up in the morning. Um, definitely if he gets seemed a little more like overstimulated and I, I'm the same way. That's my, my, like if things seem too loud or just too many noises going on. I really, that's when I notice like, oh, I think I need to step away. Um, and yeah, probably that. Or if he's just feeling like feeling sick, even though there's nothing physically wrong with him. What is it like for you to see him in that state? It's really hard. Yeah. I think that's the hardest thing. And seeing him to struggle. Not you, daddy. Yeah. I just, I wish I could be able to, you know, just quit my job and come home and take care of everything for them. And it's not the way my life is, so. What is it like to balance that reality while still being optimistic and supportive for the children? They make it really easy, <laughs> the kids do. You guys are the best. I mean, they're just so, um, I think Natalie's probably been exposed to a lot more stress than most 11 year olds. Um, so I think we just, Jeremiah and I will talk like, oh, let's try not to be talking about too much stressful things around the kids because we need to you know, keep things positive for them. But then we remember like, this is our reality, you know, this is life. Um, 
and everybody's life is different and everybody's got different stresses and it's okay if our kids are growing up a little bit differently than other people's kids are because they're great kids <laughs> and they're great people. Um, so I think it's okay. It can be hard, but it's okay. What do you think, Isaac, when your dad shares all of this stuff about you? Do you like him? Mm -hmm. Does it bother you when I talk about this stuff? Mm -mm. It doesn't? Would you rather talk about other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't bother you, but you'd still rather talk about other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you could change one rule your parents have, what rule would you change? To watch cartoon, more cartoons in bed. Is it that? Mm -hmm. If somebody just found out they're gonna have a brother or a sister with SMA, what advice would you give them? Treat them the same way that you would if they didn't have SMA. So definitely be gentle with their bones because they're weaker, but still be funny and still pick on them and still let them do the same to you.